The countdown is underway for the epic first launch of the Artemis Lunar Landing Program. We preview the final five CubeSat missions, and Percy discovers volcanic rocks that have interacted with water. Get ready for our return to the moon, today on WSN Space Newscast. Greetings! The drama of the Apollo era is about to return. At 9.53 a.m. Eastern, or L-46 hours, 40 minutes before the initial targeted T-Zero, the launch team arrived at their stations inside the Launch Control Center. At today's mission briefing for reporters, officials noted that there were no significant problems on the launch vehicle. Artemis mission manager Mike Sarafin did report one small issue with communications coverage plans for the Orion and ICPS upper stage, which he expected to be resolved very quickly. Regarding the 4-inch hydrogen bleed disconnect, which leaked on the last wet dress rehearsal, the launch director said that they will know if the connection is tight by around 3.30 Eastern on Monday morning. There was considerable discussion of the potential abort scenarios and outcomes of the mission. Here are some of the briefing highlights. This is something that has not been done in over 50 years and is incredibly difficult. We will learn a great deal from the uh, Artemis One test flight. And uh, through this experience, we will change and modify anything necessary to, to prepare ourselves for crewed flight on the very next mission. We understand that there's a lot of excitement about this, but the team is very focused. In terms of our mission priorities, they determine our courses of action. Our number one mission priority is to uh, test the uh, vehicle at lunar reentry conditions. We need the rocket to do its job in order to set those initial conditions up. Number two priority is to demonstrate the vehicle in the flight environment. Number three priority is to retrieve the spacecraft for programmatic cost savings and reuse of avionics. Uh, also to reuse the crew module for environmental testing, and then to retrieve the data on board. And then number four is what we call bonus objectives, our payload objectives. So we're really focused on that. Uh, once we lift off, uh, we'll start uh, immediately, uh, uh, about seven seconds in, a uh, roll to the heads down position to put uh, Ryan in that head down position. Uh, at 54 seconds in the flight, we'll be supersonic going uh, Mach 1. Uh, a minute and three seconds, uh, we, uh, we will get to an about, a boundary where if we lose a single engine, uh, we'll be able to make uh, our mission priority one objective that Mike uh, spoke about. Uh, we continue on uphill, uh, two minutes and 10 seconds, the solid rocket boosters will separate uh, and then we will start our closed loop guidance control, uh, targeting uh, the insertion point. Uh, a little later on, about a minute later, at uh, 3 minutes 11 seconds, uh, we'll have the SM panel jettison, which will expose the service module and the, uh, the uh, stowed solar arrays on that module. Five seconds later, uh, we'll have the last jettison, or the launch abort system jettison, uh, and that will expose the Orion uh, crew module. Uh, that will be the start of our uh, uh, abort capability after that last jettison. Uh, we'll start with our mode two abort, which is also known as untargeted abort splashdown. Uh, we'll continue to press. Uh, after three minutes and 23 seconds, uh, we'll have uh, uh, a boundary which we call press to Miko. Uh, if we lose a single engine, uh, we'll be able to make full mission after that three minutes and 23 seconds. Following that around five minutes or so as the uh, uh, combined vehicle continues on uh, uphill. Uh, the uh, SRBs that we previously jettisoned will splash down in the Atlantic. Uh, continuing forward, uh, we'll have uh, at seven uh, minutes and 26 seconds, we'll, uh, we'll start our overlap of our mode four abort, also known as abort once around, which means uh, we can make uh, the Pacific or off the coast of uh, California. Uh, and then we will end our Mo2 abort at 7 minutes, 33 seconds, uh, which uh, will be uh, the point at which our uh, initial impact uh, point, our, our instantaneous impact point, uh, reaches the, the coast of Africa. At 8 minutes, 1 seconds, uh, we'll command Miko, and, uh, and we'll leave the vehicle at about 400,000 pounds weight. 
Uh, continue on from there, uh, we'll deploy the solar arrays uh, from the service module at 18 minutes MET. That'll take about 12 minutes uh, and uh, give us the ability then to charge the batteries on the Orion uh, capsule. Uh, continuing forward, once we deploy the solar arrays, we'll have our perigee rays maneuver, which uh, will bring up our perigee uh, from 16 nautical miles perigee to 100 nautical miles. Uh, that will be at 51, uh, about 51 minutes, and uh, that'll be about a 20 second burn. Continuing forward, uh, we will have our final uh, burn that is done by the uh, ICPS upper stage. Uh, that will be the translunar injection burn at approximately uh, an hour 36 minutes, following uh, shortly at around a ma uh, an hour and 44 minutes, uh, splashdown of the core stage uh, in between uh, Hawaii and the West Coast. Uh, about 10 minutes after we do the T TLI uh, burn uh, completes, which is an 18 minute burn, uh, we will then uh, separate the upper stage uh, from the Orion space capsule. Uh, the Orion space capsule will continue on to the moon uh, and its mission. And uh, shortly thereafter, I will hand over uh, to Rick LeBrode, the lead flight director for this mission, and he will start with his uh, modal survey. So, Rick? All right. Thank you, Thank Judge. You, Judge. All right, and as Judd said, uh, uh, after TLI, Orion will be on its way to the moon. On the trip out to the moon, we're going to perform a series of, of, of small correction burns. It's just to make sure that um, when we encounter the, loon, loon, uh, uh, the lunar, our first lunar encounter uh, is going to be on target. Uh, that'll be on flight day, on flight day six. Uh, when, we, when we pass by the moon, we're going to be approximately 60 miles off the surface of the, of the moon. And that's when we're going to do our first uh, large burn. It's called the outbound powered flyby. And that burn is going to then send Orion up to the distant rate retrograde orbit. So on flight day 10, um, we'll do our second large burn, and that'll actually insert Orion into the, the DRO, the distant retrograde orbit. We'll spend just under, under two weeks in orbit uh, around the moon. And then on flight day uh, 23, we're going to go ahead and depart. Uh, the DRO and start heading back to the moon. That's our DRI burn. And then on flight day 35 is when we'll encounter the moon again and we'll do our return power flyby, our last large burn, and that burn actually is going to target entry interface. It's essentially our, our deorbit burn. And then on the return leg, we'll continue to do a series of those correction burns to make sure that uh, uh, we're right on target for the entry interface. Um, Throughout the mission, we're also going to be performing a lot of uh, checkouts and, and, um, and demonstrations just to get a better feel for how, uh, how uh, Orion is going to operate in that environment. Um, also, if, if, uh, if at any time during the mission, uh, Orion encounters a problem, uh, a serious problem, that warrants bringing Orion home early, we can, uh, we can select um, early return trajectories, we also call them aborts. And it's really dependent on um, what phase of the mission we're in when that happens. Uh, on the outbound leg, we could do uh, direct aborts, where we just turn around and come right back to the Earth. Uh, or we could change the tra trajectory to a lunar flyby. Um, once, we, um, once we've gone into the DRO, we're a little bit more limited, but we can depart early if, if, uh, if necessary and the timing's right. And then uh, in all these cases, it would just bring Orion back, uh, it would bring EI in um, uh, earlier. To, to, to get it back safe and sound. Um, the teams, uh, we've worked through all these scenarios. We're fully trained on, on all the various options, uh, have those standard procedures to, uh, to, to take care of these actions if necessary. Um, and then uh, once we've done our RTC-6, our return trajectory correction uh, burn number six, then uh, we'll hand over to Judd's team for the last phase of the mission. All right, thanks, Rick. Yeah, as, as Rick, Rick mentioned, our, essentially our deorbit burn is, is way back at the moon, uh, that return power flight uh, by uh, uh, burn. That's about a week before uh, we get to, to, the, uh, to the Earth. Uh, and uh, that's targeting an entry interface um, uh, point in space, and that's uh, 400,000 feet above the Earth's surface. Uh, and, and for this particular launch day on the uh, 29th, that'll be just to the, uh, the, the southeast of Hawaii. Uh, 20 minutes uh, prior to that entry interface, uh, we will separate the uh, crew module from the uh, service module. And uh, the crew module will perform a separation burn that will raise its uh, altitude slightly, uh, make that uh, uh, 
make sure that we have a proper separation and proper uh, angle uh, to enter, re-enter the, uh, the Earth's atmosphere. We'll be performing a skip um, entry on this uh, mission. Uh, essentially, uh, we'll come in at uh, 400,000 uh, feet at, at about uh, a little over 24,000 miles per hour. We'll uh, dig into the Earth's atmosphere at about uh, 200,000 uh, feet above the uh, Earth's surface. Uh, we'll uh, roll to, to make the, the capsule's lift, lift vector uh, go uh, skyward again. Uh, we'll get to a, an apogee uh, of the capsule around uh, 250,000 feet, and then we'll uh, continue to descend down into the atmosphere all the way uh, to the, uh, the uh, Pacific Ocean. Um, we'll, we'll have um, various milestones along the way, particularly uh, at around uh, 28,000 feet. We'll, we'll jettison the four bay cover that will expose all of the main parachutes and drogues. And uh, by that time, uh, we will have slowed down from that uh, uh, 24,000 uh, miles per hour to roughly 500 miles per hour. Uh, correction, uh, 300 miles per hour. Uh, we'll deploy the, uh, the main chutes and uh, come down a soft landing uh, in the Pacific Ocean right in the, uh, the vicinity of uh, the recovery forces. We will uh, stay uh, in, in the ocean for approximately two hours while we do some uh, thermal soap back uh, tests uh, to test the capsule for, uh, for when the uh, capsule becomes uh, crewed on Artemis II. Uh, and then we will hand it over to uh, Melissa Jones and the recovery team. Back to you. Judd and Rick, thank you so much for that detailed look at what to expect. And yeah, why don't we turn it over to Melissa now for recovery? Thank you. Ready to quote at that time is one in 125. And the team does what they call a probabilistic risk assessment based on the known failure modes of the individual subsystems, levels of redundancy, common cause failure, a whole host of factors. And they look at, um, they look at the individual flight phases, the ascent flight phase, the in-space flight phase, and then the reentry flight phase. And anything that is seen as a catastrophic cause associated with that probabilistic risk assessment um, goes into the uh, assessment. And then each cause itself, whether it's number one, number five, number 100, is assigned a probability. And uh, some of our top risk drivers are common to any other program out there. Micrometeoroid orbital debris is a, is a key risk driver. Um, the uh, parachute system on the vehicle is a key risk driver. Um, and uh, we've got a couple of others that, um, you know, the heat shield, uh, the reentry thermal protection system, those are all critical systems that have to work. And those are in our top drivers. Um, obviously, the, the duration of the mission affects your micrometeoroid and orbital debris risk. The longer you're up there, the longer your window of exposure is to a critical hit associated with micrometeoroid or orbital debris. Um, Heat shield is kind of a byproduct, um, or there's a there's a relationship between the thermal protection system and the orbital debris environment, uh, specific to the back shell of Orion, not specific to the base heat shield. Uh, the base heat shield is not exposed until you get to crew and service module separation, which is only about 20 minutes prior to entry interface. So the the opportunity for a micrometeoroid deploy or micrometeoroid impact is very limited associated with that. Um, the other top risk drivers uh, that I can think of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the SLS uh, avionics and software, uh, the Orion um, propulsion system were all key drivers. So, you know, each of those has a different flight phase effectivity. Obviously, the SLS avionics and software only affect the launch vehicle up to the point where it's done its job. Um, Orion has a much larger window of exposure to all of its risks. The propulsion system has to work from the point that it separates from the um, from the launch vehicle all the way to the point of entry interface. So each of those have a different ranking, and uh, those those are the top risk drivers that come to mind right now. Um, and that's what drove that one in 125 number. Under the radar, there are some concerns about how long SLS has been out on the pad, exposed to elements. Perhaps this is a question for for Mike. Um, but I'm just wondering if you can kind of quantify, I know it was briefly mentioned at one point pushing into the fall might cause some concerns about 
how long SLS was out there, but at this point, how much of a concern is that related to corrosion or other elements? Thanks. Yeah, we do uh, track what we consider to be limited lifetime items, and uh, we've got a whole host of systems that um, either were previously activated or we had to be mindful of their, um, of their timing relative to setting up for a launch attempt. Uh, certainly the uh, loading of hypergolic fuel that's used for reaction control systems uh, is one of those items that we look at. There are a whole host of other um, items that we do track. Um, none of those right now relative to the launch uh, period that we're looking at are our key risk or key concerns. And, and we did review those at the, uh, at the flight readiness review. And, and while we understand there's a non-zero level of risk associated with uh, the amount of time that hardware elements from the, from the tip of the Orion spacecraft all the way, all the way to the uh, tail of the rocket have been out there, um, we, we've characterized that, we've been tracking it, and right now there aren't, there aren't any poke outs that we're concerned with. Yes, we'll be assessing the weather while we're in the distant retrograde orbit before we uh, depart the orbit uh, and make that assessment. And we can, we could stay in the DRO. It's a very stable orbit. Uh, there's very um, minimal use of consumables as far as prop or anything else. So we could easily stay in, uh, in the DRO for another lap, which is another couple of weeks. And then uh, I'll hand it over to Judd to cover uh, options for the entry piece of it. Yes, for the entry piece, uh, essentially our, our trajectory over the, the face of the Earth is set um, way back at that RPF uh, or when we do our deorbit burn from, from the moon. So we only have a fixed uh, amount of things uh, that we can do to correct that. We have, do have the ability to essentially, um, if depending on where, where we decide we want to do that, we have the ability to, to modify the, um, the timing that we uh, get to the Earth uh, by maybe plus or minus a day, uh, but that means we, we have to know really you know, a week in advance. Other than that, uh, the day of, uh, we have the ability to either uh, land a little bit longer, uh, you know, closer into uh, to San Diego, uh, kind of near the, uh, the Catalina Islands, um, or uh, we can land shorter, uh, which uh, will be up to uh, 1,200 nautical miles away from, from um, uh, San Diego Site 3, uh, which is our main landing site. Uh, obviously, we can, we can make that decision. We'll, we'll, we'll make that decision three days or so before uh, we actually uh, get to entry interface, and that'll be in consultation with uh, Melissa and her team uh, as, as that, uh, the ship will be about halfway in between that 1,200 nautical mile range and 600 nautical miles uh, to make that decision whether, whether that team heads uh, inland or uh, continues out to the, the 1,200 nautical mile range. Weather at the Cape this afternoon is very poor, and one of the Pad 39B lightning masts was struck around 1.30 p.m. The forecast for improving conditions by Monday morning continues, though, and a 70% go probability still stands. If SLS can't get off the pad on Monday, the next opportunity, driven by need to replenish high liquid hydrogen in the pad tank, will come on Friday, September 2nd. Some computer models are forecasting tropical systems in the Atlantic around that time, although the timing and nature of any threat to Florida is quite uncertain. NASA tweeted that today is the 8th anniversary of the completion of the SLS rocket's key decision point C milestone, approving its transition to full program development. Looking back at the press release from that date, we see that initial flight was slated for no later than November 2018, which was said to be a conservative schedule commitment. Today's tweet also noted the work of more than 1,000 contractors across the U.S. over these past eight years. To congressional supporters, this is a feature, but to those in the space community seeking greater efficiency, this definitely is a bug. Planet, which has over 200 Earth observation satellites, presented this video captured by their Skynet satellite. The video shows the Artemis rocket on Launch Complex 39B two days ago. 
Now it's time for our in-depth previews of the final five CubeSats aboard Artemis One. Cusp, Aquelius, Lunar HMAP, Lunir, and Nea Scout. Three of these CubeSats were not recharged. Lunar HMAP, Lunar IR, and Cusp. Just a bit bigger than a box of cereal, one of the first CubeSats to travel in interplanetary space will be NASA's Miniature Space Science Station, dedicated to studying the dynamic particles and magnetic fields that stream from the Sun. The CubeSat to study solar particles, or CUSP, will hitch a ride out of Earth orbit aboard the first flight of NASA's Space Launch System, or SLS. Once the CubeSat is ejected, it will orbit around the Sun in interplanetary space, measuring incoming radiation that can create a wide variety of effects on Earth, from interfering with radio communications to tripping up satellite electronics to creating electric currents in power grids. CUSP will be able to observe events in space hours before they reach Earth, said Mihir Desai, the principal investigator for CUSP at the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio, Texas. Such interplanetary observations would give us significant insight into what drives space weather, helping scientists to improve their simulations. CUSP is a six-unit CubeSat, meaning it has a total volume of about six liters. This microsatellite will carry three instruments, and the observations from those instruments will give us an unprecedented look at our interplanetary space environment, which is driven by the Sun. The Sun releases a constantly flowing stream of particles and magnetic fields, known as the solar wind. Interspersed are faster, denser clouds of solar wind material, known as coronal mass ejections, or CMEs. When these CMEs, or even a particularly fast stream of solar wind, reach Earth, they can interact with Earth's magnetic field, creating what's called a geomagnetic storm. It is the buffeting of the magnetic fields and the release of energy that can stress power grids and impact space technology. To understand these effects on Earth, Scientists want to track how the space environment changes and develops between the Sun and Earth. Currently, measurements of the space environment come from a dozen or so satellites, all carrying different sets of instruments. Most of these satellites are in one of two basic orbits, circling either Earth or the L1 Lagrange point, a point between Earth and the Sun about a million miles from us. Right now, it's like we're trying to understand weather for the entire Pacific Ocean with just a handful of weather stations, said Eric Christian, lead Goddard scientist for CUSP. We need to collect data from more locations. To create a network of space weather stations would require many instruments scattered throughout space millions of miles apart. But the cost of putting together such a system built out of full-fledged satellite missions is prohibitive. CubeSats like CUSP might be able to help solve the problem. Though the satellites can only carry a few instruments apiece, they're relatively inexpensive to launch because of their small mass and standardized design. So, CUSP also serves as a test for creating a network of space science stations. If you had, say, 20 CubeSats in different orbits, you could really start to understand the space environment in three dimensions, said Christian. The three instruments that CUSP carries will each provide a different contribution. The superthermal ion spectrograph is built by the Southwest Research Institute to detect and characterize low-energy solar energetic particles. NASA Goddard's Miniaturized Electron and Proton Telescope, or MERIT, will return counts of high-energy solar energetic particles. Finally, the Vector Helium Magnetometer, or VHM, being built by NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, will measure the strength and direction of magnetic fields. CUSP was born of opportunity. Originally CUSPP, with two Ps, standing for CubeSat to study solar particles over the poles, it was slated to fly in low Earth orbit, studying solar particles near Earth's poles. But when the call went out for CubeSats to fly on SLS, the team realized they had an opportunity to do some serious interplanetary space weather research for a fraction of the usual cost. With only a relatively small amount of additional funding to reconfigure the satellite and instruments, the team won a spot on SLS for a ride to interplanetary space. Equilius, developed jointly by the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, JAXA, and the University of Tokyo, will travel to Earth-Moon Lagrange Point 2, 
and Earth-Moon orbit where the gravitational pull of the Earth and Moon equal the force required for a small object to move with them. The CubeSat will demonstrate trajectory control techniques within the Sun-Earth-Moon region and image Earth's plasmosphere, a region of the atmosphere containing electrons and highly ionized particles that rotate with the planet. The name stands for Equilibrium Lunar Earth.60 spacecraft. Skywatchers will also notice that it is the name of a small constellation of faint stars listed by Ptolemy. The name is Latin for Little Horse. Equilius will measure the distribution of the plasmosphere, providing important insight for protecting humans and electronics from radiation damage during long space journeys. The CubeSat will also measure meteor impact flashes and the dust environment around the Moon, providing additional important information for human exploration. Equilius will be powered by two deployable solar arrays and batteries, propelled by a warm gas propulsion system with water as the propellant. Equilius will be released to begin a lunar flyby sequence over a period of one to three months, followed by maneuvers exploiting Earth-Sun-Moon dynamics over five months. This will bring it to a libration orbit around the Earth-Moon L2 Lagrange point using a minimal amount of propellant. It will make observations from this position for about one month before the mission ends. The Lunar Polar Hydrogen Mapper, known as Luna HMAP, was developed by Arizona State University and sponsored by NASA's Science Mission Directorate, SMD. It will measure the distribution and amount of hydrogen throughout the Moon's South Pole. If successful, the Luna HMAP spacecraft will produce a high-resolution map of the Moon's bulk water deposits, unveiling new details about the spatial and depth distribution of potential ice previously identified during a variety of missions. Confirming and mapping these deposits in detail will help NASA understand how the water got there, how much water might be available, and how it could potentially serve as a resource for longer exploration missions on the Moon. The CubeSat's mission is designed to last around 60 days, consisting of 141 science orbits. Its primary science objective is to use a miniaturized neutron spectrometer to count epithermal neutrons and map water abundance in the south polar permanently shadowed regions from low altitude, 8 to 25 kilometers, at resolution better than 20 square kilometers. After it is deployed from the space launch system it will use lunar flybys and its ion propulsion to enter lunar orbit, then will shape the orbit to achieve its nominal 4.76-hour elliptical polar orbit with an apple-yoon altitude of 3,150 km and a paraloon of 8 to 25 km. Communication and downlink will take place every 3 to 5 days. The mission is scheduled to last a minimum of 2 months making neutron measurements. At end of mission, when the propellant runs out, it will be targeted for a lunar impact. Planetary geologist Craig Hardgrove, Arizona State University School of Earth and Space Exploration postdoctoral research associate, proposed the mission and will be overseeing it as principal investigator. Luna HMAP will be designed, built and tested on ASU's Tempe campus, in partnership with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and several other partners supplying space-qualified hardware and services. As Luna HMAP flies over the lunar south pole at a very low altitude, it counts the energies of neutrons that have leaked out of the lunar surface. The energy distribution of the neutrons that hit the detectors tells us about the amount of hydrogen that's buried in the top meter of lunar soil. Lunar Infrared Imaging, formerly known as Skyfire, is a 6U CubeSat designed to perform a lunar flyby followed by a deep space technology test to address questions related to transit and long-duration missions. The primary objectives of the mission are to address strategic knowledge gaps SKGs, for surface characterization, remote sensing, and site selection observations for the Moon, and SKGs for long-duration missions to Mars. The primary mission goal is to collect data that will enable future risk reduction for crewed missions. It was developed by Lockheed Martin Space in Denver, Colorado, and sponsored by NASA's Advanced Exploration Systems Division under the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. Tyvac International, a division of Terran Orbital, built the spacecraft bus, while Lockheed developed the sensor and its cryocooler. Ground Network Communications Station support is provided by Kongsberg Satellite Services through its 13-meter dishes. The stations are in Chile, Norway, 
and the Troll Station in Antarctica. The CubeSat will conduct a lunar flyby and use an advanced miniature infrared sensor to gather images and data about the lunar surface and its environment. This effort will help collect data to address knowledge gaps related to transit and long-duration exploration to Mars and beyond. The CubeSat will collect data about the lunar surface, including material composition, thermal signatures, presence of water, and potential landing sites. Its infrared sensor will be able to map the moon during both day and night and can collect data at much higher temperatures than similar sensors, thanks to an innovative microcryocooler, similar to a refrigerator, designed to reach cryogenic temperatures below minus 234 degrees Fahrenheit. After deployment, it will perform a lunar flyby, taking images of the surface to characterize the moon's thermal environment. After the flyby, it will conduct technology demonstrations related to maneuvering and deep space operations related to future Mars missions. Through its investigation of the lunar environment and advanced operational techniques, this powerful CubeSat will provide key pieces of data advancing the state-of-the-art technologies and increasing operational confidence at deep space destinations. The Near-Earth Asteroid Scout, or NIA Scout, will be the first CubeSat to travel to an asteroid. It will be America's first interplanetary mission using solar sail propulsion. Using photons from the Sun, the spacecraft will be propelled using its solar sail to fly by a near-Earth asteroid, 2020 GE, upon which it will use a high-quality 20-megapixel array optical science camera to image the target and address key strategic knowledge gaps. These asteroids are of interest not only for human exploration, but also for science, in-situ resource utilization, and planetary defense. The small payload was developed by NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville and the agency's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. NIA Scout will be propelled by a square-shaped solar sail that will measure about 925 square feet when unfurled. The sail is made of an aluminum-coated plastic film that is thinner than a human hair, with an area about the size of a racquetball court. NIA Scout is outfitted with a high-powered camera that will take photographs of and collect data from a near-Earth asteroid that represents asteroids that may one day become destinations for human exploration. Observations will include the asteroid's position in space, its shape, rotational properties, spectral class, and geological characteristics. NIA Scout's mission will take approximately two years. The NIA Scout spacecraft is housed in a 6U CubeSat form factor. It will be different from all previously flown solar sail systems. Its objective is to use the sail for controlled flight to affect a close flyby of the target asteroid. Given that the solar sail is a single sheet deployed on four booms from the center two units of the three-axis controlled spacecraft, any asymmetries between the center of pressure CP, of the sail with the spacecraft system center of mass CM, will result in a torque on the system that must be carefully managed to maintain attitude and thrust control. To manage the CP to CM offset and other solar pressure-induced torques, NIA Scout will use an active mass translation AMT, device, reaction wheels, and incremental changes in velocity provided by an onboard cold gas thruster system. The technologies developed for NIA Scout, including the boom geometry, sail membrane, deployment system AMT, and algorithms for managing the sail's momentum and attitude are being transitioned into a much larger and more capable sail system for the planned NASA Solar Cruiser mission, planned to fly later this decade. The suite of onboard science processing commands developed for NIA Scout enables high-resolution imagers to capture large amounts of data and prioritize the most important aspects for downlink during bandwidth-constrained mission scenarios. This is accomplished through a collection of downsampling, cropping, and compression routines, which can be used together to significantly reduce the volume of data which is sent to Earth while not sacrificing resolution. Once a target region is identified, cropping can be commanded as either a specified region of the image or around the brightest object in the image. This produces high-resolution cutouts around the target and relevant stars, which can be downlinked for a fraction of the bandwidth allocation when compared with the complete image. The onboard target detection technique allows trajectory verification and refinement, the detection of targets of opportunity, automated target tracking and target survey and classification in future missions. 
During the development of this unique spacecraft at Marshall, a special fixture called Dreadnought was created. Dreadnought was designed to support integration and test of NIA Scout after a failed fit check with the flight dispenser. It supports a CubeSat safely, while providing maximum visual and physical access in and out of the dispenser simulator. The CubeSat can be translated horizontally into the desired position, dispenser, or fixture in a slow, controlled manner. Dreadnought also affords control while maneuvering the CubeSat into a vertical position. This support is necessary for CubeSats that are sensitive to bending, as was the case for NIA Scout. The elevated table provides full access to the upper CubeSat surface and room to fully open upper and lower 3U long solar panel wings. For NIA Scout, Dreadnought allowed custom fitting of the upper and lower solar panels into the dispenser, necessary due to out-of-plane condition of flight solar panels. When in the simulator, fit of the panels was easily observable and access was available for measuring clearances. This allowed correlation to the dynamic analysis models for better prediction of behavior in vibration testing. NIA Scout will demonstrate the feasibility of using a low-cost, solar sail-propelled CubeSat on an asteroid reconnaissance mission. It will be a pathfinder for many potential missions using sail technology in the future. Onboard data analysis enables new mission profiles, which are not possible with traditional methods for analyzing science return. Altogether, the NIA Scout mission will be a pathfinder for a capability that can benefit a variety of future missions, big and small.
As promised yesterday, here is our coverage of this week's news from the Percy rover on Mars. Perseverance makes new discoveries in Mars' Jezero crater. The rover found that Jezero crater's floor is made up of volcanic rocks that have interacted with water. Scientists got a surprise when NASA's Perseverance Mars rover began examining rocks on the floor of Jezero crater in spring of 2021. Because the crater held a lake billions of years ago, they had expected to find sedimentary rock, which would have formed when sand and mud settled in a once watery environment. Instead, they discovered the floor was made of two types of igneous rock, one that formed deep underground from magma, the other from volcanic activity at the surface. The findings are described in four new papers published August 25 in the journal Science and Science Advances. The first paper offers an overview of Perseverance's exploration of the crater floor before it arrived at Jezero's ancient river delta in April 2022. A second study details distinctive rocks that appear to have formed from a thick body of magma. The other two papers detail the unique ways that Percy's rock vaporizing laser and ground penetrating radar established that igneous rocks cover the crater floor. Igneous rocks are excellent timekeepers. Crystals within them preserve details about the precise moment they formed. Quote, One great value of the igneous rocks we collected is that they will tell us about when the lake was present in Jezero. We know it was there more recently than the igneous crater floor rocks formed, unquote, said Ken Farley of Caltech, Perseverance's project scientist. This will address some major questions. When was Mars' climate conducive to lakes and rivers on the planet's surface, and when did it change to the very cold and dry conditions we see today? However, because of how it forms, igneous rock isn't ideal for preserving the potential signs of ancient microscopic life that Perseverance is searching for. In contrast, determining the age of sedimentary rock can be challenging, particularly when it contains rock fragments that formed at different times before the rock sediment was deposited. But sedimentary rock often forms in watery environments suitable for life and is better at preserving ancient signs of life. That's why the sediment-rich river delta perseverance has been exploring since April 2022 has been so tantalizing to scientists. The rover has begun drilling and collecting core samples of sedimentary rocks there so that the Mars Sample Return Campaign can return them to Earth. The second paper solves a long-standing mystery on Mars. Years ago, Mars orbiters spotted a rock formation filled with the mineral olivine. Measuring roughly 27,000 square miles, nearly the size of South Carolina, this formation extends from the inside edge of Jezero Crater into the surrounding region. Scientists have offered various theories why olivine is so plentiful over such a large area of the surface, including meteorite impacts, volcanic eruptions, and sedimentary processes. Another theory is that the olivine formed deep underground from slowly cooling magma, molten rock, before being exposed over time by erosion. Yang Lu of NASA's JPL and her co-authors have determined that last explanation is the most likely. Perseverance abraded a rock to reveal its composition, studying the exposed patch, the scientists homed in on the olivine's large grain size, along with the rock's chemistry and texture. Using Perseverance's Planetary Instrument for X-ray Lithochemistry, or PIXL, they determined the olivine grains in the area measure 1 to 3 mm, much larger than would be expected for olivine that formed in rapidly cooling lava at the planet's surface. This large crystal size and its uniform composition in a specific rock texture require a very slow cooling environment, Lu said. So, most likely, this magma in Jezero wasn't erupting on the surface. Two more papers detail the findings of science instruments that helped establish that igneous rocks cover the crater floor. The instruments include Perseverance's SuperCam laser and a ground-penetrating radar called RIMFAX, radar imager for Mars subsurface experiment. SuperCam is equipped with rock vaporizing laser that can zap a target as small as a pencil tip from up to 20 feet away. It studies the resulting vapor using a visible light spectrometer to determine a rock's chemical composition. SuperCam zapped 1,450 points during Perseverance's first 10 months on Mars, helping scientists arrive at their conclusion about igneous rocks on the crater floor. In addition, SuperCam used near-infrared light to find that water altered minerals in the crater floor rocks. This is the first instrument on Mars with this near-infrared capability. However, 
The alterations weren't pervasive throughout the crater floor, according to the combination of laser and infrared observations. SuperCam's data suggests that either these rock layers were isolated from Jezero's lake water or that the lake existed for a limited duration, said Roger Weens, SuperCam's principal investigator at Purdue University and Los Alamos National Laboratory. RIMFAX marks another first. Mars orbiters carry ground-penetrating radars, but no spacecraft on the surface of Mars have before perseverance. Being on the surface, RIMFAX can provide unparalleled detail and surveyed the crater floor as deep as 50 feet. Its high-resolution radargrams show rock layers unexpectedly inclined up to 15 degrees underground. Understanding how these rock layers are ordered can help scientists build a timeline of Jezero Crater's formation. As the first such instrument to operate on the surface of Mars, RIMFAX has demonstrated the potential value of a ground-penetrating radar as a tool for subsurface exploration, said sven Erik Hamran. RIMFAX's principal investigator at the University of Oslo in Norway. The science team is excited by what they've found so far, but they're even more excited about the science that lies ahead. Reporting from Cyberspace, this is correspondent Karen Calvis. Beginning today, we'll feature unique videos covering the Artemis mission and imagery of vehicle manufacturing and processing. Hi, I'm Jennifer Vollmer. I'm the Flight Ops Integrator for Space Launch Systems Engineering Support Center here at Marshall Space Flight Center. And this is Rocket Science in 60 Seconds. When the Space Launch System, or SLS, launches with the Orion spacecraft, I'll be here in the SLS Engineering Support Center, monitoring the rocket and communicating with other centers and experts across America. A voice loop is simply a dedicated phone line, similar to a conference call. Here at Marshall, we can listen to 150 voice loops all at one time. We are always prepared to help solve problems during countdown, launch, and flight of the world's most powerful rocket to ensure we have a successful mission. Hi. My name is Chelsea Walker. I'm a materials and process design engineer for Northrop Grumman, the lead contractor for the solid rocket boosters of NASA's Space Launch System. This is Rocket Science in 60 Seconds. These boosters produce 7.2 million pounds of thrust during liftoff and flight. I work on the insulation that protects the SLS solid rocket booster during flight. Here, in the Insulation and Component Work Center, the insulation, a rubber-based material, is applied to the inside of the rocket motor case to protect it from the burning propellant. Combine raw materials together through a two-roll mill to form a sheet. We then apply the insulation to the metal rocket motor case. After the insulation is cured, a liner is applied. This is an adhesive that helps propellant stick to the insulation. Then the case is ready to go to our casting facility where it is loaded with propellant. Hi, I'm Amanda Gertie Jensen, and I'm the Senior Production Manager for Final Assembly for NASA's Space Launch System rocket, and this is Rocket Science in 60 Seconds. The core stage is the spine of the SLS rocket. It's two huge propellant tanks, and four RS-25 engines provide over 2 million pounds of thrust to launch NASA's Artemis missions to the moon. Because of the size of the hardware, the core stage components are connected in three major joints. First, we made the forward skirt to the liquid oxygen tank to the inner tank to form the top part of the rocket or the forward joint. Then horizontally, we made the liquid hydrogen tank, followed finally by the engine section. To properly align the flanges as they come together, we use live photogrammetry on six bolt locations to make sure they properly align. I'm Mary Kalajian. I'm an engineer at Aerojet Rocketdyne working with Structured Light on the RS-25 engine program for NASA's Space Launch System rocket. This is Rocket Science in 60 Seconds. Structured light is a process in which light, structured in grids, is projected onto an object so that the resulting geometries can be digitally scanned and analyzed. The 
RS25 engine is the size of a car and is made up of hundreds of components. Structure Light allows us to measure and evaluate each part 10 times faster with greater accuracy and at lower costs than we could in the past. We're continuously discovering new applications for this amazing technology. Imagine being an astronaut on board a spacecraft with a damaged part. The damaged part can be scanned and digitally repaired, can then be downloaded on board to the 3D printer, manufactured and applied to the spacecraft. Hi, I'm Jennifer Takeshita. I'm the Teledyne Brown Manufacturing Lead for the Launch Vehicle Stage Adapter. We're here at Marshall Space Flight Center, and this is Rocket Science in 60 Seconds. So the LVSA connects the SLS core stage to the interim cryogenic propulsion stage at the top. My team works with NASA to create 430 feet of defect-free welds. That's the equivalent of one and a half football fields. The launch vehicle stage adapter is 27.6 feet in diameter at the bottom, 16.8 feet at the top, and it's a 30-foot tall cone, approximately the size of a three-story building. The LVSA connects and protects. It connects the core stage to the in-space stage while protecting the in-space stage to give Orion its necessary boost to the moon. T 
T-minus 30 seconds. Minus 25. Minus 20. Minus 15. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have ignition of NASA's Space Launch System five-segment solid rocket booster. CO2. CO2 activated. Activate quench tool command forward and ask CO2. Activated. The full two-minute test has concluded. Now the carbon dioxide quench arm pumps 31 tons of CO2 into the booster. The carbon dioxide quenches any burning of the insulation without damaging it to preserve the state it was in during the test. This allows the team to get the best data about how it will perform in flight. There's quite a bit of action remaining for the teams here as they ensure the test area is safe and the data are recorded. Following motor burnout, the chamber will be sprayed with 2,300 gallons of water per minute on the underside of the case to help cool it down. This will cool the chamber from 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit to 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Avionics engineer, verify that the Solistic has finished saving the log files. In work. Roger. Redline monitor operator, transfer the log file to the local computer. Roger, in work. Roger, bus monitor operator, transfer the data files to the local computer. In work. T plus four minutes. Redline monitor files have been transferred to the local computer. Roger.
And that's the way space is today. Since this may be our last broadcast prior to the Artemis launch attempt, let us close by wishing everyone involved in the countdown the very best of luck. Go Snoopy, go Sean, go Munikin Campos, go NASA, go Big Orange Rocket, go Orion, and by all means, let's resume the exploration of the moon.